Um, and I'm just going to give you a whistle stop tour on this really, really um, great big topic. Um, but really what we'll focus on is improving polyp detection. I'm gonna go through some classifications to look at polyp morphology and how we link that with cancer risk. We'll look at different advanced imaging technologies um, and talk through some classification systems there as well. And finally finish off with um, some cases and um, point you towards a framework for training in optical diagnosis. Um, so here really we've, we've talked through actually with the first couple of lectures um, on quite a few of these um, topics, but really I just kind of wanted to bring it all together here and emphasize the points that actually getting the basics um, does improve your polyp detection rate. So I know we've got access to advanced imaging, dye spray, AI, et cetera, but ultimately if the bowel prep isn't sorted, you're not gonna see any polyps. So it's really important never to forget about that. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Sorry. Um, why is classifying polyps um, important? So it really is important because not all polyps have the same neoplastic potential. Um, there are polyps that are benign, hyperplastic polyps in the rectosigmoid, which we don't need to resect um, as they don't harbor any um, malignant potential. And if we can use the devices, the techniques um, and tips that we have to differentiate these polyps, we can save time, we can save cost of histopathology, we can save the patient um, unnecessary polypectomies. I think it's also important to classify polyps because we do need to be able to recognize cancers um, and recognize areas of cancer within larger lesions, which does make a difference to which resection method we use or whether lesions are even endoscopically resectable at all. Finally, also, um, it would be really nice if we could assign accurate surveillance intervals using optical diagnosis. Um, so again, um, that could be another KPI as well. Um, so when we talk about polyp morphology, I think it's, it's really, we're looking at the shape of the polyp and the Paris classification has been around for a long time and it gives us quite a simple structure quite a standardized way of describing the shape of a polyp. So you've got type one lesions, so they're protruded, two that are flatter, um, 2A superficial elevated, and three that are frank cancers, so they're excavated lesions. And you can see like in this um, image here, and I'll, I'll talk through this case in more detail in the video, um, but there is mixed morphology. So you can have um, more than one type of um, um, shape to the polyp, so to speak. Um, and here you can see there is a, a dominant uh, sessile aspect to this polyp. And really this is important because different shapes are associated with different um, cancer risks. And type 1S and type 2C polyps or polyps that have this incorporated into their morphology are the ones with a higher cancer risk. Um, we can also look at large colorectal lesions um, according to the LST classification. So really these are granular and non-granular laterally spreading tumors. And again, the cancer risk differs with these two um, types, as high as almost 40% with pseudo-depressed non-granular LSTs. And, and this is important really because the resection method will differ. And I think you know, we really need to be aiming for on-block excision for non-granular LSTs. Um, versus say a homogeneous LSDG, which you could remove with piecemeal EMR. Um, in this example here, these are um, both LSDGs, nodular mixed type. Um, and when they were removed, actually the nodular component did contain high grade dysplasia, but the rest of the lesion in fact was an adenoma with low grade dysplasia. So it is really important when we assess lesions in detail to appreciate the morphology. Um, I'd just like to touch on dye spray briefly. I don't think we should forget about dye spray even in this era of advanced imaging. I think it still has a big role to play. I um, mean, I think we can use it very well selectively actually. So I, I still use dye spray for IBD surveillance. Also patients with um, uh, polyposis syndromes, particularly uh, serrated polyposis, I think it's very useful um, for picking up flatter lesions. When we talk about dye spray, I think I really um, can't 
um, fail to mention the Kudo classification, which is one of the oldest classifications around. And really, actually, it's a way of us looking at the structure of a polyp, the surface pattern on the polyp, um, to associate that with particular histological types. Um, and this is really uh, what we're talking about with optical diagnosis. And we've got lots of other techniques to help us do this. With the Kudo classification, I think um, what you really want to pay attention to is type five. So type five um, polyps contain cancer and 5N in particular would be polyps um, that would suggest deeply invasive cancer. So if you see a completely amorphous area on a polyp, um, this should be ringing alarm bells um, when you assess these lesions. Um, so briefly, advanced endoscopic imaging, we've heard a little bit about this already. I mean, there are obviously so many different types that we use. Olympus produces NBI, TXI, AFI, Fuji does a BLI, and Pentax does eye scan. And the fundamental basis is that they help enhance mucosal patterns and vessel patterns and allow us to uh, classify polyps, allow us to appreciate any degree of neoplasia. And even when it comes to resection, allow us to look at the margins for resection or post-resection um, allow us to appreciate any residual polyp tissue. Um, so it's very useful. How do we use these technologies? So they're push button technologies. I've, I've brought up here the NICE classification, which is for narrowband imaging, and it's very simple. So really you use a very straightforward structure looking at the color, the vessels and the surface pattern um, to classify your polyps into benign hyperplastic polyps, adenomas or cancers. Um, and we'll, we'll use this on an example um, in a minute. Also, I just want to highlight another important classification, the JNET classification. So this is used um, a lot more in, in the East, um, but obviously we do use it um, here as well. And it's, it's quite useful because you've got an extra category type 2B, um, which highlights a polyp that has variable caliber um, vessels and irregular surface pattern, but um, perhaps not deeply invasive submucosal cancer. So, um, these polyps can still be endoscopically resected. And I think that's why it's useful um, to learn these classifications as well. So on this example here, this is a diminutive um, polyp. You can see here, um, it's, if you use the nice classification on this, it's a type two lesion. So you've got um, the white structures, which are the pits. You can see they're regular. You've got very nice brown vessels surrounding that. Um, there isn't an area of disruption. There's nothing worrying about this polyp. Um, so this is an adenoma. When we um, talk about polyps with malignant potential, we can't forget about sessile serrated lesions. And I think um, the WASP classification um, by the Dutch group uh, is in fact a very good uh, way of us recognizing features of sessile serrated lesions. Um, and I think I'll point this out to you here with this lesion you can see, you've got a mucus cap over it. Um, you've got dark spots within these pits. These are quite characteristic features of sessile serrated lesions. Um, and you've got a fairly indistinct um, border as well. So when you see these features, this does point you um, towards it being a sessile serrated lesion. And it is important for us to recognize this um, polyp type separately. Um, Fuji have got blue light imaging, um, so I don't have time to talk about lots of the different um, imaging technologies, but I think this one's pretty important as well. Um, and again, there is a separate classification, but fundamentally um, the basics um, are the same really. You're looking at the pit pattern, you're looking at the surface, and you're looking at vessels. Um, we've um, grouped these into different, um, um, different categories and different features which will allow you basically to use an algorithm to um, optically diagnose a polyp and this has been validated as well. Um, so as an example here, so this is a polyp captured on blue light imaging and you can see it's got a smooth regular surface. There are two different sorts of pits. You can see there are round ones and elongated ones um, and you've got vessels around um, the, uh, the pits. And if you apply the basic classification to this, 
um, it would suggest it's an adenoma. So it just gives you a structure when you look at these polyps. And I think sometimes often you, you look at polyps and intuition tells you, right, that's an adenoma. And that's because you've seen it lots of times before. But I think when you're trying to learn optical diagnosis, it is really important to have um, a structure in the scene goes here, this is a hyperplastic um, polyp. So finally, I just want to draw your attention to this document, which um, I'd urge you to check out um, and read, but really it gives you a framework for training in optical diagnosis. Um, and the fundamental is that you need to understand all these classification systems. Um, you can teach yourself a lot of things, um, and I think it's important to try and incorporate optical diagnosis into your daily practice um, with regular assessment of lots of diminutive colorectal polyps and an adequate amount of larger colorectal lesions. And I think it's particularly important as well if you're doing screening colonoscopy um, to be able to assess um, neoplasia within larger colorectal lesions. Um, I will just finish off by showing you um, some examples that I've got here. So this is how we um, use optical diagnosis in, in real life. So the first case, this was a lady, she was actually a fairly elderly lady um, who presented with iron deficiency anemia. And it turned out in fact that she'd had a right hemicolectomy for colorectal cancer several years ago that had been lost um, to follow up. And you can see on this image, you might be able to appreciate, um, there's a subtle polyp just off in the distance here. This is um, a, a white light image on a Fuji 700 series uh, colonoscope. And we're gonna use the technologies um, to have a look at this in further detail. So we'll be getting closer to it. And you can see actually here, very indistinct borders. You've got a lesion that runs actually now from about six o'clock all the way up to nine, 10 o'clock and very subtle, very easily missed. Here on LCI, um, which is linked color imaging, that improves the contrast between normal mucosa and neoplastic mucosa. And you can see you've got a very bright image here. It also highlights the vessels. And I think this technology is really good um, to pick up flatter, more subtle lesions. Here on BLI, again, looking at the vessel pattern in a bit more detail, you can see these lacy vessels running across the surface of the polyp. Um, and you can see the pit pattern um, as well. This is it again on LCI. And here, I just um, want to show you as we're pulling back, um, actually this lady has got more than one lesion and I think LCI is very good um, for this. So I, I use it quite routinely on withdrawal now um, in place of high definition white light um, for certain cases. Um, and you can see this lesion looks quite worrying. So you've got several different types of um, pit patterns uh, going across here. So the edges have got a rounder pit pattern, but the center is what is concerning. Um, and this, in fact, on BLI, you can see it in a bit more detail, although there is no magnification, which would have helped. Um, you've got loss of um, the pits in the center. You've got disordered uh, vessels. And this is, in fact, uh, a cancer. It's, it's a cancer that's arisen from a sesarcerated lesion. So, um, Bearing in mind, obviously, this lady has had a cancer before that needed right hand colectomy. Um, and if we've got time, I'll just quickly run through the second case, um, which I showed you a picture of earlier. So again, this is a lesion in the rectosigmoid. Um, and we can see here, we want to appreciate the morphology of this polyp. Um, and you know, we can use the Paris classification to do this. You'll see it's got a sessile component. We are worried about malignancy when we do look at this polyp. It's also got an area of depression. Um, on LCI, you can see uh, you can see the contours of the polyp um, far more easily. It just really highlights the contrast here. Um, and just moving on on BLI, this gives us a better idea of the vessel pattern and the um, pit pattern. And you can see there are some areas where the vessels are darker, they're wider in caliber, 
they're not all looking the same. So this would indicate that these are areas um, that uh, may contain cancer. Just again, you can use advanced imaging to interrogate the edges of the polyp to delineate um, the lesion margins, and it really helps you plan your resection uh, much better. This polyp was, uh, did in fact contain um, adenocarcinoma. It was an SM1 uh, cancer, but it was completely resected. Uh, so I think that's all um, I've got time for, but uh, thank you very much for your attention.